one of the thing I always tell my students that, I mean, Tory party is the most successful political party in UK's history. That's, that's quite telling, isn't it? It's, 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 it's a fact, isn't it? It mm -hmm. is a fact. And today they are being branded as the most diverse party fielding candidates. Um, but we know that Empire worked on collaboration and complicity. Yeah. So this yeah. is just Empire 2 or Empire Redox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, where, this is where also the politics of representation goes wrong. The politics of representation of having women, queers, and you know, mm. uh, people of color, etc. We all know how that works, mm. um, and it's, it's just ticking boxes, and it doesn't really help much. Um, mm. Mm. Priti Patel has probably been even worse than Theresa May as Home Secretary in terms of uh, deporting people uh, or not respecting the Charter of Human Rights. Yeah, I mean. Malcolm X has got a fam famous score. We, we've, we've said that before as well, uh, but I guess this has been going on for ages. Everyone looks in their interests and uh, if your personal interest um, is secured, then it doesn't really matter where mm. the community of people, the community as in people go. Mm. 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 She'd probably deport her own parents if she wanted, if it, it was something to do with a personal, you know, career graph where she would become the prime minister and she was asked to deport her own parents, she'd probably do that. <laughs> That's a flippant comment, but I, I think she's almost there. These are very painful topics because they have kind of uh, captured, you know, I was reading a lead capture by Taiwo. Olufemi Taibo, and they have captured this social justice vocabulary and mm. made it their own. And made not just made it their own, but made it to work for them you know, mm -hmm. in their favor, to their advantage. And that is scary. It is really dangerous. Mm. Because mm. now we are we can no longer use concepts or terms that uh, philosophers and you know scholars have kind of come up with without running the risk of appropriation. Mm. Um, there is appropriation, but then there is also appropriation with bolstering the power structures that are already there. So mm. we are in that situation today. Mm. Mm. I don't know what you think of it. I'm like more in the politics side of the story, so like more international relations and then, you know, geopolitics and foreign policy. I mean, it's the same pattern, isn't it? So um, you can see like in the UK, they're quite worried about, you know, Boris Johnson was partying and all those things, but they're not worried about, you know, the same guy was selling weapons to Saudis and then which will be bombed on Yemen. So they, everyone knew it, knows what's going on there. So, I mean, there is a kind of ideals, you know, they, they care about in a like domestic, arena but in the external arena they don't care you know I, I don't think you know during the colonial history like 300 years 400 years we never saw any protest in like London against you know colonization did did any protest happen in London or other places I'm, I'm sure scholars have worked on that and I'm sure there were protests um, I, I think Priyamita Gopal's book uh, tells us about that mm, uh, mm. The book is really very interesting in, in this term is riveting in terms of uh, terms of how the the reverse tutelage happened mm. uh, and the, the ideas that germinated in uh, outside the empire excuse me outside the empire were then brought into the empire and you know mm. asked for other things not just an end to colonization but mm. also other social rights you know yeah. or human yeah. rights mm. and I, I think that's a really important point that she's trying to make that she's actually made in her book mm. Mm. is reverse tutelage that the idea is, and most scholars today are also looking in terms of knowledge and exchange as co-constitution that, you know, if the West creates the rest, the rest also create the West, you see. Mm. Um, mm. So, so it's, 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 it's a two-way process. It doesn't go only one way, right? Mm. What the West does is, is, is geopolitical West because there is no West. What the geopolitical West does is of course, grant itself the entitlement of claiming 
that they have this claim to knowledge or they made this or become became the first. There is this whole rush or race towards being the first at the origin of, um, mm. Mm. which I find extremely uh, exhausting, tedious, mm. but at the same time, we have to deal with it because that's already there. We are already entering that mind territory of, you know, the first and the origins and which has already been laid out for us uh, mm. as mm. such. So, so I, I think in that, in that sense, uh, Gopal's uh, work actually speaks to this about reverse tutelage and that we shouldn't forget it. There is, of course, an exchange of ideas uh, mm. from one to the other, from the, from the empire to the colonies, but also from the colonies to the empire. Uh, mm. And that's how, it, ha that's how anti-colonial movement or social justice movements were shaped. So I'm sure if we look into the archives, there must be you know, anti-colonial yeah. protests mm. everywhere in London. Um, mm. So, mm. as far as Britain goes, uh, what really works in favour is, of course, uh, of course, the idea of the soft power that they've always claimed. You know that they will train students here, and the students will go back, and they will, uh, you know, become the arms of the British Empire. And this has continued for ages. Now, what is interesting? So, this is the world we live in. This is the world we inhabit, and this is the world that we've inherited. But what is interesting is all the people coming, studying in British universities and not repeating what British universities want them to repeat. You know, there are, there are dissenters to that. Uh, they, they are not towing the official line always. Mm. They are in a way, but they're not always towing the official line. Some of them go back, some of them don't go back. Uh, the ones who remain are the ones who go back. Some of them also become dissenters. Mm. And, 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 claim their space, rightful space, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, those are the ones that, that interest me. Gopal is one of them, of course. Yeah. Uh, those are yeah. the ones that interest me is how they are trying to make the dent in the system so mm -hmm. that you know, the, the power dynamic, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. can be you know, at least mitigated. The, the effect can be mitigated so that mm -hmm. it is not, you know, the, the brunt is not borne by people always on the other end of the spectrum. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so, so, uh, so I think, yeah, that, that there, there have been people like that always. Mm. They've always existed. It's just that we are not made aware when we are studying, you know, whatever subject we are doing, maybe politics, literature, history, or art. Uh, we're not made aware of that because we're made of, aware of a particular standard account of mm. the discipline. It, mm. it would be the same in politics for your international relations for you. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not very well versed with international relations, but I'm sure mm. the way you know the European universities were set up, it was about the standard accounts of, of European domination, mm. and and, mm. and that is very difficult. That is very difficult to uh, to kind of uh, walk away from. Um, mm. Mm. The the thing the the thing with the thing with walking away is is someone in France who works on that, and someone uh, in France who is extremely pertinent is Mabula Sumahoro. So Mabula Sumahoro um, has a very interesting thesis about it, uh, where she says that, yes, we study canonical authors, but we study more than that. So our, uh, so we also study the non-white, the POCs, the, the people of color. And so our knowledge is further more complete than the ones who've only studied canonical authors. Or our knowledge is more because we can speak different languages from Africa, or from Asia, from wherever we are from. And mm. then if you claim that we are deficient in any sense, it's on you, not on us, because we've studied what you've taught us, but we've also studied more than that. So I think she makes a very relevant point of the completeness of education, um, mm. Mm. Which, which is for, for me, which is extremely pertinent in terms of not just reading standard accounts, but also reading accounts that deviate from those standard accounts, mm. right? Mm. In any case, queerness deviates from any standard accounts, like from heteronormativity or marriage or whatever it is, uh, mm. even though there is same-sex marriage, but you know, that's a different thing. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, will it be okay if, if we talk about, you know, like, I mean, things like where you're born, you know, raised, 
about our story because I really love to you know see our story as well. Um, would you be okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. So I was born in India, um, and then mm -hmm. of course, of course, um, my life has been in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, Brighton, Leicester, France. Uh, and my sister now is in Australia, so I, she's my only sibling. Um, and so we have an Australia connection, both of us. <laughs> okay. Uh, she's my only sibling. Um, and she moved to Australia 10 years back, uh, around okay. 10 years back. I think it's eight or nine years back. Uh, and so I, she, because she's my only um, biological sibling, uh, I'm very close to her. Uh, and so I go there. My parents are now in India and they come to us in France or in uh, or go to um, Australia. Mm. So uh, my PhD is from Leicester. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's so I have four, four countries where I, I have a connection. And <laughs> I have four countries uh, where I allow myself to speak and to criticize and, 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 and the empire, the, the empire is the US. Uh, which mm. most of us are aware of what is happening in the U.S. because of its prominence in the world. Mm. Mm. So that's, that's I, I keep myself up to date about the U.S. as well. Uh, mm. But my main connection is France, India, and Britain. Mm. Mm. That's, I mean, that's how it is because I reside in France. I've been I've been in, in and out of France for the last 22, 25 years. Mm. Mm. Just like one of the questions I always ask my guests is like, I mean, looking back, I mean, how did you see your parents actually, you know, shaped your understanding about the world? Because we, we always, you know, because our, our parents played such a big role in our lives, you know, so I always try to get back to those, you know, I'm not sure, like, because I lost my dad very early age. So, you know, I've got those yeah. Yeah. kind of, you know, romantic idea about, you know, parents and then the, the, yeah. the caring home. <laughs> Um, well, um, I, I can't speak for everyone else because I think everyone's parents are different yeah, and people have yeah, been through yeah. um, a lot of biological parents' violence. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. I tend not to over, over say it, but I've had a very loving family. I've had mm -hmm. a very loving um, childhood with parents who always supported me, my sister. We were just a very small group, like just the four of us, mm -hmm. um, always bonded together. Um, and uh, my parents have always been very supportive. I think it's a very it's it's a great challenge to them the kind of work I do. So when mm -hmm. I do when I finished my PhD, they started reading about queer because they had no idea what queer was, yeah. and they said they wanted to get, you know know yeah. what I'm doing. And then they were like, okay. And then five years down the after the after PhD, I started working on decolonial. Uh, thinking and decolonial commitment. And so they were like, but you were supposed to work on post-colonial stuff. What is decolonial now? We don't know what is happening. So I, I think they're lost in that way, but they also make that effort to engage with my work in their own way, which I don't even know if I understand what I do, but I don't think it's fair for me to ask them to know what I do because mm -hmm. it's very difficult for them. My father was a meteorologist. And mm. so he's a very scientific oriented person. So he doesn't understand all of this, uh, mm. even though um, we have talks about heteronormativity, transgender and everything at home. Um, mm. And um, especially because my sister has children. So I want to play an active part uh, in, you know, telling children about transgender and heteronormativity and of course, heteropatriarchy. Uh, mm. So at the very um, young age, I would take them to prides and I would speak with them about these issues with my parents, because mm. my parents are also carers for the children at times yeah. when they're yeah. in Australia or in France. And, and, and so my parents, I have this notion um, that I always tell everyone is that if your parents raised you, you also raised your parents they know who you are because you give them pointers, you give them signals of who you are and what you really want. Not that it's always been easy talking about social justice to my parents because we all come from, yeah. I come from a position of privilege and mm. you know how it is in South Asian societies in terms of caste, for instance. Mm. Uh, so mm. I come from the Brahmin caste, which is terrible mm. in terms of oppression of you know, exclusions that we create. Mm. Uh, so sometimes uh, more of 
from the north, we are all very complicit in these systems of injustice. And if we try to undo them, there is resistance within the family. Mm. Right? So I'm not saying that, you know, it's always been um, easy for me to kind of, you know, work with them um, for, about issues of caste, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, sexuality is, has been fine. Um, and it's, it's really funny because sexuality doesn't really make any difference, but caste does. And that's where we know what India is about. It's about caste, mm. basically. So my sexuality is fine, but I'm not sure if, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I can't speculate, but I'm not sure if I had a person who uh, I loved would be of another caste and, you know, that wouldn't create a problem. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know because this has not happened. So I don't know. I can't say. Uh, they can be extremely... Um, they can be extremely welcoming of everyone that I like uh, without getting into the politics of caste. But I don't really know if something goes wrong that they will not start saying things about caste. That's the thing. Because it's never happened, so I don't know what can happen. That's the thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the kind of relationship I share with my parents. Uh, we share a loving bond in terms of food, food and clothes, because we like to buy clothes for each other. And also um, we like to share recipes. My parents and myself, we love sharing food and, you know, showing love through food and, you know, making new things. Uh, and it's, 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 it's always really um, surprising for anyone, even when um, we are at home and there is no guest, we still lay the table, we still have a proper, you know, meal, um, and we, we don't drink water from the bottle directly, there are glasses, and it's, it's never rushed, it's always we sit down for a meal, it's never <laughs> rushed. no matter how difficult it is, because we have to go here or there, we always sit down to eat, and, you know, with proper cutlery and plates and everything, and it's all set, the table is set. And this is something that I've learned from my parents. And we don't get the utensils that we cook in directly onto the table. We put it in the casseroles or we put it in, you know, pans or di different things, pots and pans and, you know. Uh, so so it's, it's always been like that. That generates a lot of work because every meal is like that, mm. um, but it's a ritual. So I think we bond over food as well. Uh, and, and, you know, the, this kind of, we always have discussions about food. Brilliant, yeah. I, I don't know what your relation with your mum is. <laughs> I mean, my so my mum also lives in Scotland. Uh, so we are three brothers and sisters in Scotland. We share our burden. So right now, my mum is staying with with me. So during the summer, she tends to stay in my house. Um, and I do lots of gardening myself. You no, know? so I, I try to grow like you no know, Bangladeshi vegetables. <laughs> Which is oh difficult. In <laughs> Scotland, is yes. Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, like my mom, she's like you know, 78 years old. She still loves to cook, and and you know, we we allow her to. You know. So you know, she becomes my child, you know. <laughs> so she's a child now, um, and she she clears all those tantrum, you know, like <laughs> about food, you know, like why the food is not that good, you know. The things we cook i mean so she's very critical about those things so that's okay yeah. so it's, it's a very loving loving kind of family but also my mom is very religious as well um which sometimes create tension but i i i, I try to you know bypass all those you know talks with my mom um, because i really don't want to you know be confrontational with her at at her you know, juncture of her life. Uh, so I try to make her as happy as possible, try to be as, you know, <laughs> like acceptable, whatever she does, accept it, you know, and and basically say yes to everything. <laughs> um, and, and in terms of my wife, my wife is a great cook, um, but I'm not sure, like you might give me, you might share some, light on this because my, my wife is very territorial in terms of the kitchen i'm not allowed to touch anything <laughs> sometimes i steal things from her and then put things in my you know 
And then she's just free. And then she knows like I've done something here. <laughs> so I'm I'm seriously oppressed in my house by <laughs> these two women. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, they they love me and they're kind to me as well. So it's just, you know, like my endeavor about you know trying to learn some cooking, they just no, don't do it. <laughs> in Bangladesh, the 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 cities we came from, they're like, you no know, Mughal, like heritage. So they tend to cook quite a lot of things and, and lots of things get wasted. And, and I really don't like it. But I can see that the cultural part of it, you know, it's it just so entrenched. You just cannot break this. Um, no, you can't. You can't. You, you, you can't. I mean, my, 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 my parents would never sit down with just... Um, <laughs> with just one dish there will be at least two dish dishes so one will be uh, whatever it is you know the lentils or whatever they've made so mm-hmm. something that is curried and the other will be the dry dish what they call the dry dish so there will be yeah. two one vegetable and one you know legume that they have uh, so it is it is just very cultural and and the kind of lives we lead uh, and the time that we don't have generally mm-hmm. I will make probably dal for for five days and that'll be it uh, because there is no time there is no time so yeah. mm. and i'm very finicky about eating as well i'm very finicky about what i want to eat um, mm. i don't want to eat something that i will not enjoy so mm. it, it makes sense for me as well to be you know like my parents to be extremely um, you know to have this in life that food has to be respected and you know you sit down mm. to eat because you know we just lead very wayward lives. We just, we're always very very busy mm. for no reason sometimes. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I mean it's quite interesting because I really want to share this thing as well. Because my wife works full time. She works for NHS, um, and she comes back after her you know eight hours ten hours shift, and she tends to cook every night every night. So the way I see it, perhaps this is her hobby. She enjoys it. So this kind of comes her down. This gives her relaxation. First, this is her meditation. I, I can understand that. I can understand that because I would probably do the same. I, I do the same most of the times after if I work for like six, seven hours on the computer um, mm. in, the, uh, in the day and I come back and if there's nothing good, I would, I would cook. I do that. Mm. I, I cook in that case because mm. it doesn't take so much time making food, you see. Um, and I don't make four or five dishes. I make one dish, but I will still make that dish. Mm. Uh, but and it is kind of relaxing. It is kind mm. of relaxing for me. Mm. So I, I don't know what your wife thinks, but for me, it is kind of relaxing. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, okay. So that's 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 a good good discussion about our lives. Um, so, like, tell us your story in Paris. I mean, how. I mean, what kind of challenge do you face in Paris? Because Paris is like, I've, I've been in Paris a couple of times. I mean, I don't know. I, I, don't, I never liked, you know, big cities, you know. Uh, I was in London, like, last week in the Marxist festival. And I, I, I thought it's a kind of dystopian town, you know, even the tubes, the noise they make. I mean, it's like, I couldn't stay there, you know. Like, I mean, I just like, tried to flee from London. It's like then I went to like you know um, Charles Dickens museum, um, and I one quote I found. This is from like a tale of two cities, which is like Paris is one of them and London. And then there's a famous quote: "Is uh, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times." So I, I went to London. It was the best of my times as well. You know, we went to this festival, but at the same time, the surroundings, that you know, the transports, the like everything is extremely hostile, extremely hostile. Mm-hmm. What's your take on Paris? Um, Paris, is, Paris is, I think, very similar to London and not very similar to London, as you say. Uh, it is similar to London in the sense that it's a big sprawling city, um, just like London could be or Dhaka or Delhi or Melbourne could be, yeah. you see. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just that you've got to get used to it. So I don't live in Paris. I live outside Paris. Um, mm. I can't afford to live in Paris, to be honest. Um, but, you know, um, 
it's it's very good if you are a tourist because there are lots of things to see and do mm-hmm. it's very good if you're living outside paris and you want to see exhibitions and if you're interested in art there's always something on um, right. the louvre is the biggest museum yeah. i guess in europe and I, I don't know if it's in the world but at least in europe it's the biggest museum and there are always these exhibitions so there's a lot of cultural programs happening mm. lots of things happening mm. perhaps not yeah. the scale of what happens in london right mm. Um, mm. because france yeah. remains extremely uh, different in terms of cosmopolitanism uh, as far as London is concerned. I mean, London is very different from France. Mm. Um, France would probably be more provincial and they, they've got their own idea of what cosmopolitanism is. Mm. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of people, uh, I guess, I think I'm more interested in people than in, 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 in buildings. Uh, it's beautiful, there's no doubt about mm. it. Mm. But um, mm. in terms of people, as long as they speak the language, people are fine with it. I mean, it's the problem comes when you don't speak the language and then they either treat you as a tourist or if you live there long term, then they treat you as a foreigner because, you know, you've not even bothered to learn the language. Um, so it, it goes uh, hand in hand. So either you're a tourist, so you will not get into the inner circuits apart from, uh, mm. apart from some kind of socializing. Uh, but if you don't speak the language and don't even make the effort of speaking the language, you will be excluded. I mean, they're very clear about it. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure that's such a terrible thing, to be honest. Uh, I'm not, I don't have an opinion on it, but that's the way it is. Mm. Um, um, now, what happens in, particularly in France, is that there is a very pointed racism that comes to the people of color especially if you're Black, West African, or North African, uh, which is Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Mm. right? Now, this is, of course, as we all know, is the idea not just of Islam, but also of colonial links, or the colonial links that have never been severed. It's, and and that's, that's present everywhere. That's present everywhere. That's present in the political discussions. That's present um, in um, the hiring processes, for instance, employment. That pre- that's present in so so they they uh, that's present in the ghettos that France has made, right? So basically, when you think of um, council housing and you know big blocks of buildings, etc., you will find a lot of migrant populations. Uh, in, in those building houses. So there is the intersection of class and race at the same time, which of course there is a denial of the race angle because they just take it the, the Marxist angle of class. Mm. Uh, because of, you know, um, France's investment in you know, the, the class movement uh, generally. And, and so it all gets written down to, we are indivisible, we are one republic, and you know, there is no racism because we don't see race. And so the, the French constitution, I think about two, a couple of years back, they have removed the word race from the constitution. So there is no race, uh, basically. Mm. So this is their way, this is a way of not looking at race by looking at it, basically. Mm. Uh, it's denying the, uh, the existence of race um, by totally erasing it. Uh, so the, the way we have diversity um, uh, tabulations in Britain, for instance, mm, you know, mm. all those equal opportunities forms, those are banned in France. You do, cannot make the statistics. There is no way of finding out anything. The state controls the discourse on race. Okay? Mm. By not talking about race, we have erased the impact of race, which is racism. So I think a lot of sociologists have always made this very clear that when we discuss race, we're not talking about biological race. We, we know that biological race is, um, is non-existent, but what we are discussing is about how race affects people's relations to each other in mm. terms of employment, in terms of housing, in terms of lots of other opportunities. So now what I've started saying is that I don't discuss race, I am discussing the impact of race, which is racism. So there, the, the, you know, there's the discourse is already present everywhere, but of course, we don't believe in race, but we know that you know racialization and racism are sociological pro- social problems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is one way of entering into you know an exchange 
with the French society because they're willing to listen to this rather than when you come up with, I will talk about race, everyone will be very close. So there are ways of making these, you know, uh, paths inroads in into, um, into uh, national debates. Um, mm. Mm. But I guess the, the whole idea of two cities you were talking about, so I'm thinking of two countries, uh, the whole idea is that the way and this is not to exonerate Britain of anything, mm, right? Mm. Not of the empire, not of the violence, not of the prevalent racism, but the way I see it by, you know, frequently navigating both the countries or having frequently navigated both the countries in various capacities. Mm. Uh, the way I see it is it's in terms of space, the space of whiteness, in Britain, Scotland, uh, England, or wherever we are, is very present, right? Uh, but there is also a space of communities of color, mm, mm. which has been denied to communities of color in France. Mm. So if they have a marriage, their marriage is too loud, <laughs> so they will start saying they will ban it. If there are any, um, Algerian flags after football matches, they will start banning it. Uh, it's, it's just very much towards, as I said, very much towards communities of color of former colonization. You know? mm. Whether it is the anger at the loss of these uh, colonies, or it is we don't want to change because that's what helped us. I don't know what it is but it is very present that communities of color are totally absent from the public space. And when I say totally, it is stark to anyone who goes from Britain to France. It is really stark because you're not allowed to wear certain clothes. You're not allowed to do certain things. It's, it's just very much present. It doesn't look so much in Paris because of course Paris is a big city and you can find enclaves, enclaves of communities of color but you go a little outside Paris and you will notice how white France is and how whiteness occupies space and not willing to give up that space. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so they will, they will talk about um, France being a country that is like, like their own version of secularism that they've invented. Uh, but um, today is the 14th of August, uh, France is celebrating its national day. Hello, France. Happy National Day. Uh, <laughs> I, think Happy it's, Day. <laughs> I think it's 14th of July. Lie, yeah, sorry, 14th of July is, the, is, is France's um, Bastille Day, so National Day. So, so all that you know, military might will be on display in Paris. Uh, <laughs> very masculine military might, <laughs> which, you know, which is ridiculous, but you know, that's the way it is today. Uh, and so they will, they will continue talking about, we don't want religion, we don't want religion, but then you have holidays for Christmas, you have Christmas is closed, so there's, oh, Christmas is pagan, it is not Christian, you get, okay. Then you will have holidays for Easter, oh, Easter is not Christian, so suddenly nothing is Christian, right? Um, and then you will also have the 15th of August, the Virgin Mary something, and you go, oh, that is, that is France's Catholic background. So why don't you just say that France is Catholic, period? Because that's the way France is run. Sunday is a holiday, Christmas is a holiday, Easter is a holiday, 15th of August is a holiday. And there is one more, I think the Ascension Thursday or Monday or whatever it is, there's one more somewhere there. So all of these, out of 11 public holidays where everyone is supposed to stop working, six of them are related to Christianity. And then the claim is that we are secular. No, France is Catholic. France is not secular. And there is no harm in accepting it. There is no harm in accepting it. But the only issue is the hypocrisy and the arrogance and the whiteness of it, which is just bursting at the seams and nobody wants to see it. Mm. Uh, not even very progressive people. Uh, you will get a lot of people and you, oh, so you want us to not have a holiday. I say, no, you can have a holiday, but you can also have a holiday for Eid which is one of the most celebrated festivals in France as well, or you have it for none, but it can't be two, you know, it can't be two ways, uh, but it's, it's about, so basically what they are trying to say is, it's about who was in France first, and we all know that means white people were in France first, 
And so France mm -hmm. belongs to white people. Whereas, you know, the empire made it very different, just like in Britain. The empire made it very different. You know, mm -hmm. nobody asked people to go and conquer lands. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, so I think there is this thing, and this is something that I'm saying, but I'm probably the only person saying it because nobody wants to accept this because of the idea of France being extremely secular and, you know, despite the fact that, you know, six holidays are Christian. But mm. uh, so I don't know if it is a, I, I really don't know, to be honest. I don't know if this is a fight worth fighting because, you know, it doesn't really make a difference. There are six holidays and people deny that it's, it's Christian. Okay, does that really make, change people's lives? I don't think so. So I think we shouldn't mm. attach too much importance to it. But what mm -hmm. we do attach importance to is, you know, the housing and accom uh, accommodation and employment and, you know, all the discrimination that happens most of the times, which is very difficult to prove, which is not very easy to prove anyway. Mm. Uh, so, mm. so I think that's much more um, critically significant for changing lives rather than getting one or two holidays here or there even though I do think that people should get their holiday and on need, but you know, that's, that's, that's not a debate that's happening in France, not at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, what you are saying, it sounds like, you know, when you talk about citizenship, it, it looks like, you know, there are different kinds of citizenship, you know? So we are talking about France has got almost 10% are actually immigrant population. So, I mean, how can you exclude 10% of your population? And when you're yeah. talking about nation building, I mean, how does it work? Can you exclude 10% of the population from nation building? So in, the, in terms of citizenship, it is very clear. Uh, so I got naturalized in France and mm. I have a naturalization certificate. And so today when I raise voices and I'm asked to go back home, <laughs> wherever that home is, because I don't know where that is. Um, so my home is where, where my partner is and where, where the house that yeah. I bought, and that's my home. So I thought, oh yeah, yeah. I'm going home in 10 minutes, don't worry. That's where my home is. And so when, you, when you're like, oh, you're not, you're not from France, or it comes to, yeah, but you shouldn't have come here then. Or it comes to, you know, these are the general things that you hear most of the times when you start questioning uh, uh, the French nation, because you can't touch the French nation because the only revolution that happened, which is ridiculous because the first one was Haitian, before that was Haitian. The only one that happened was, of course, the French Revolution, where, you know, just after the monarchy was, came back as well. But nobody wants to know that uh, so whenever this happens and people talk about you shouldn't criticize the french nation because otherwise you, you go back home you know and, and the, the whole idea so then the only thing i can depend on is my naturalization certificate which says that there is no difference between me and anyone who is born in france and this is illegal to discriminate between me and anyone who's born in france Right. So I was like, so are you saying that there are two, two kinds of people, like one who are French French and the others who are not French French, you know? And so the only way is to get, get, them get, get it back to them with the naturalization certificate and say that France does not recognize this discrimination. So if I'm criticizing France, I'm criticizing it as a citizen as well, mm. right? Mm. Even though I think we all criticize the United States without being the citizens of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, you know, so I'm entering a, a particular logic of citizenship, which, uh, as we all know, is, is a very tenuous logic, and it doesn't hold much, because a lot of people who did not get the citizenship were actually French. Right? Mm. So, in terms of the citizenship, it's a very interesting debate, because when I was applying for the naturalization certificate, um, or the naturalization, um, the procedure, one of the, um, one of the uh, rubrics was changing my name, whether I wanted to change my name. And the logic behind was that if I change my name to a more French name, and I this is really interesting because it's a more French name then I'll probably not be discriminated against. And I was like, okay, so they have their rules uh, from Sandeep, to whatever. So from Sandeep, you can go to a Catholic name because they have a Catholic calendar and you have all these names in the Catholic calendar. So again, Catholicism is extremely present in France. It's just that we don't want to see it. It's, it is a Catholic country per se. I mean, you cannot deny it. Um, and 
one of the things was if your name is Saeed, then you can change it to a Catholic name or Stefan or Sebastian or whatever it is. I mean, Saeed is a more beautiful name anyway. And for me, and this is what I told her, the, the, the lady, the agent who was there at the prefecture. And I said, for me, the only person I know Saeed is Edward Said. <laughs> and, only, but, and if ever I've heard a name said Said, a, a first name called Said, it's in France. For me, it is associated with France. So it's a French name for me. So why do I need to change it? No, no, you need a French name. And if you want to do it. And I was like, well, no, because either I'd like to keep Said or Sandeep rhymes with Sandra and you can make my name Sandra. And she was, she was extremely annoyed. And she said, but Sandra is a girl's name. And I said, well, <laughs> if I'm changing my name, why not change everything? You know, yeah. I, I, I'm open to changing it. And I showed the logic, I think to her, that this was Catholic violence. You're asking me to take a Catholic name and you're asking specifically Muslims to take Catholic names. Said is a Muslim name and you're wanting that person to become Catholic. That's what you're saying. Uh, but that, that clause still exists. So I had some of my Indian friends who took a French nationality and changed their names oh to whatever God. they became. Uh, and I was like, this is really surprising because when someone calls you in the street, you're like 25, 30, 35, 40, and you've grown up with an Indian name and suddenly someone hails you in the street and calls you by your new name, John, or whatever your name is, you will not respond because nobody has ever called you that. And I think this, they saw the whole thing as totally illogical. And they were like, no, we want to change it back. And then France stops it. No, you've changed it, now you keep that. And so they're all called John or whatever they are called. And because there is a pressure that France will not naturalize them. Whereas, you know, you, you got to know that no if you are a documented person they will have to do it at one point they can't refuse it for no reason and there has to be a valid reason for refusing and not changing a name is not a valid reason so i stayed with my name <laughs> so sandeep is a french name now <laughs> yeah so i i think the, these are the little things that we don't realize the way catholic france works and this is how racism and whiteness takes hold by refusing that it is Catholic it, it, because they will always refuse it. No, it's a French name and a Muslim name, but French is not a religion, you know, or they would say the French and the Maghrebin or the, or the, you know, the French and the, whatever they will say uh, in terms of we are French and they are Maghrebin, but the Maghrebin are also French, but they don't realize that, that we are white and their Maghreba is probably the right thing to say. Uh, and, and, and so these are things that have percolated down from colonization uh, without any thinking of what colonization achieved in the colonies or not achieved in the colonies, the violence that was inflicted. Uh, so the new trend is to talk about the violence that was inflicted on the colonizer itself which is a ridiculous trend anyway. Mm. Or just like in Britain, you know, there, there is this thing about the British Empire em abolishing slavery before everyone else. Like, yeah, well, who instituted it for slavery? I mean, you congratulated yourself for making an end to violence that you inflicted, come on. I mean, you've got to get serious about it, right? <laughs> there is this thing about, there is this thing about, you know, at that time, everyone was racist, which is not true, A, which is not true because your ancestors were probably not all racist and B, there were people resisting it. So you don't consider slaves as people, right? Who were resisting it. Black people were not, uh, you know, they, they were not forced slavery. Are you serious? They were not forced slavery. Uh, so they, you, you think that they were forced slavery uh, or they were not people because everyone doesn't mean that, you know, doesn't include them in that case. Uh, so there is a strange logic which doesn't just remain in the wider public, which is also present very much in the university. You know, the academics are advancing these theses. I mean, you, you, we, we know all about, you know, many academics advancing these theses mm. uh, of, you know, we can't judge people of that time with, 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 the, 
with the logic for our age, uh, because everyone was racist at that time. Well, not everyone. Uh, so, I mean, the, the point has to be made. Uh, yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I, I used to have a colleague, I mean, he died a couple of years ago, bless him. Uh, but I mean, he's a funny guy, but also, you know, some of the things, you know, in this society, some of the things they say, like, you know, it's it just kind of casual. So they said that, you know, oh, you, you are so worried about, you know, the colonization thing. You know? And I yeah. think that we are also colonized by the Romans, you know, so we, we don't. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it always them. comes to the same thing about, you know, we've had it worse. Yes. I mean, like Africans have got more slaves themselves, you know, yes, like that. No, it just boils down to that. But, you know, I, I don't know if they've actually studied a book of history. Uh, if you study books of history, you know that, you know, colonization and capitalism went together. And the world as we know today is about European colonization, not about Roman colonization that happened God knows when. You know, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And, and so, so there is this kind of peremptory dismissal when, when someone is making the point about, yes, but you know, the Romans, no, there was nothing about, there's nothing about Romans that we need to talk about. The world as we know it today is what has been going on for the last 400, 500 years yep. or even more, right? Of European domination, um, which is continuing. So let's not make the point about Roman, you know, whatever. Yes, and the point is what? The point is that, you know, colonization went hand in hand. And so many other things, Christianity, you know, missionary services, education, colonial education, we've seen that, um, you know, and when, when the point about railways is made, it's really funny because, you know, the first thing they will talk about is always railways. Yes, well, do you want to know how the Algerians build? Uh, the Parisian, um, the, the Parisian metro, or do you want to know why the rail railways were built in India? Is is like when you do the research, you know why they were built. You know what really mm. happened. So I think this this is about um, wanting to have the last word, uh, mm. which is very much true of European, uh, you know, entitlement to uh, have, mm. wanting to have the last word. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But also, like, kind of, you know, the way they try to erase that, you know, the actual violence of 300, 400 years. And then, you know, oh, here is a gift, railway, you know. So, so you, should, you should cheer up about railway, you know. Don't worry about, you know, that 300 years, you know, people suffer. You know, I think Cesare, Cesare has already made it very clear. I think Cesare, when he was writing, he's made it very clear uh, on the discourse on colonialism. He made it very clear about, um, about all the gifts of civilization that the non-West received. Uh, and he just talked about the possibilities wasted. He just talked about possibilities not wasted, possibilities wiped out. That's exactly Cesare's words. Mm. Uh, possibilities wiped out. What about the possibilities that were wiped out? How do you know, we can't speculate, but how do we know that, you know, the progress wouldn't have been very different had, you know, there not been any colonial entanglement, even though that's not a very, um, you know, a uh, great line to take. But, you know, this is the logic that we we, we are working against now uh, mm. because it's, it's coming every day. The other day I was reading about voluntary relocation in terms of slavery. It, 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 it is, it was there. Um, I think one of the ministers in Britain said that, um, that minister should not be a minister. I mean, this, yeah. these are very important things. Still, a lot of black people are still going through the trauma. I mean, the trauma hasn't finished. Uh, no. Colonialism trauma hasn't finished, but slavery's trauma is even worse. It hasn't finished. It goes on and trauma studies have shown that. So mm -hmm. calling it voluntary relocation is actually much more offensive than we think it is, you know? A great replacement theory as well. So like yeah. Lee and these people, you know, Party is now in the parliament, so uh, they've got 89, 87 or 89 uh, yeah. MPs in parliament, which mm. means they will, be, they will be able to influence the decisions that will affect all of us. Um, mm. But mm. I, I, I think in terms of white supremacy, France has got nothing to learn from the United States or from Britain. You know, France has own white supremacist policies most of the times, and which don't get read as that because France doesn't believe that they are white supremacists. Uh, mm. And which is really contentious. Everyone criticizes me for saying that France is one of the last bastions of white supremacy in Europe, and nobody wants to listen to that because mm -hmm. uh, you don't need 
racism that comes through the United States or, or Britain. Racism was also invented. One part of it was also invented by Arthur de Gobineau, who was French and he wrote in French. And so all these ideas are percolated, even though he was banned, I'm very clear about it. Um, but those ideas have actually percolated. It's, it's about space, you see, the, the amount of space Muslims are allowed in France and the way um, you know, Muslims can do what they want here, even though you know, they're very controlled. But it's, it's also about space. Again, this is not to exonerate Britain of the racist crimes that they commit yeah, every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can I can compare the two and I can know um, how much people can actually speak in France and what they can say here. Mm. Right. Um, I've never felt um, that I would be muzzled in Britain, but I have to be a little more careful in France, um, mm. even though my position as an outsider allows me um, a lot of space, to be mm. honest, because I'm not at, basically at the receiving end of racism because there is a way they cannot read me. Um, am I Indian? Am I British? Am I this? Am I that? They, they, there's a way they can't read me. And plus there is queerness into it. So they can't really read much of it. So, um, and technically uh, uh, the racism against Indians is not directed at Indians in France. It is mostly against Pakistani people. Mm. Um, so it, it is also, it's just like in Britain, I think. Um, mm. Islamophobia works in a way where Pakistani and Bangladeshi Muslims uh, feel it much more than would do Hindu Indians, you know. Mm. Uh, well, when we know uh, of the collaboration <laughs> and the complicity in empire of Hindu Indians in South Asia during the empire, you know, as I said. Mm. So it's it's very, very complex system of mm. uh, power structure uh, mm. where there are different constituencies trying to maintain and then maintain power. But, but then again, you have within Hinduism, you have, you know, I think again, the Brahmin aspect. So the lower castes are always much more mm -hmm. oppressed. And, and, mm -hmm. and so they, a lot of new studies are actually saying that, you know, what, whatever happened in India was the white rulers and the Brahmin rulers, because they changed from white rulers to Brahmin uh, in India. So I think these are these are very important critiques, uh, mm. which doesn't again excuse colonization, but also talks about the complicities that 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 existed or that exist even today, mm. as we mm. see with with British politics. You see, mm. yeah. I mean, I mean, in terms of like French recent election, I mean, it looks like. I mean, it was almost like, you know, Le Pen was becoming president, almost. <laughs> it's always been like that. I mean, it's been, uh, how, how, how many times have she, has she been in the, in the second, has she been in the second round? It's always been like this, you know, it's always, I think last, last time in 2017, um, he wanted to have this, uh, Macron wanted to have this, uh, uh, this, 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 this block against her. Uh, the Republican bloc, sorry, the Republican bloc. So the Rep everyone who was Republican would be against her and would should vote for Macron. And I think that's how we won massively, I don't know, in 2017. And this year, I think that just uh, wore away. And it was almost as if she would win. But it's always been like that. But there is a new movement coming in France as well. Yeah. You see, with uh, Mélenchon, with Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the, 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 the left which has now been considered as the far left or whatever far they call left, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's really funny because if anyone speaks of justice, they are totally labeled as far left. Uh, and, and that has given people some kind of leverage of who will get elected. I'm saying mm -hmm. in a very little, uh, a very little space. Uh, so people who got elected with Jean-Luc Mélenchon to enter the parliament to become uh, MPs um, are, you know, people who you can trust for politics, for socially progressive politics, uh, mm. except that the two main blocks still remain Macron's party and mm. uh, the Front National, uh, sorry, mm. the Rassemblement National, Front National was when she was uh, with her father, the mm. Rassemblement National, uh, mm. RN. Um, so so we, we will see how this evolves, um, but mm. it's not looking great because the majority still is too much to the right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So like, I think I mean, again, there will be a lot of bashing of immigrants most of the times, like mm. as usual. Sorry, so mm. you were saying? No, I'm just uh, trying to like bring a bit of Marx here. I mean, you know, so he talks about you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So mm -hmm. we are coming to a point where France is, you know, is, is a kind of serious polarization, far left versus so-called far right or like you know, extreme right. Um, that the mi middle, the traditional left is almost like decimated. There's no traditional left. I mean, I think they got just one person vote, something like that. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, that like thesis and thesis is now is like ready for that face off. Um, and like Macron is like Malcolm in the middle. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, it's, I mean, I think things can change as well, but I, I don't think it will be in a short term. So it's a process. But no, also, I, I think, I think France has to go through lots of, you know, situation because the, the things you said about, you know, Catholic, Catholicism, you know, all those things which are entrenched in the society, the whiteness and the white supremacy. Um, it's, it's too many things are there still. I mean, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, I'm not sure like whether you heard about this film director, Michel Haneke. Um, mm. So Michel Haneke, did a couple of films around this topic area. And one of the films is like hidden. It's it's really, really good film. You know, it's like how, you know, this Algerian, you know, things kind of there, but it's hidden. But every now it's and hidden. then it, it pops up. And then, you know, they're like, oh my God, what's happening here? Um, so it's a like kind of denial, isn't it? But how long? It's, it's a denial. I think Algeria just celebrated 60 years of independence, and I'm, I'm extremely surprised that France did not hold any commemoration. I don't think France considers Algeria belongs to them. Uh, I think this was something that was that Britain was going through in the, in the, in the 90s, where, you know, the loss of India or the empire was very prominent. Um, and then it came up as wounds. Uh, and Britain, you know, with whatever trajectory Britain and India had, and uh, you know Pakistan and Bangladesh had with Britain, it changed after that. Right? Mm. Um, so it was very subtle. It took about 10, 15 years, but it was there, the new relationship that was developed. I think France will have to go through the same motion at one point of acknowledging, even though Macron has acknowledged you know, that Algerian war was terrible or whatever he said about uh, not, not especially going short of ex of ex of issuing an apology which obviously you know nations can't do uh, mm -hmm. because of you know the patriotic rhetoric that is prevalent everywhere uh, but i think at one point people will have to start thinking of as a collective you know people collectively will have to start thinking that algeria is no longer french uh, because that subconsciously they're still hold, holding on to the idea that we were an empire or we are an empire because of that. But France still runs like an empire, uh, far less than what we can see in Britain because Britain actually works like an empire. Mm. Uh, because uh, in terms of finance, in terms of you know, uh, international finance, France still has you know, the French currency, the French franc in certain, I think there are about 12 to 14 countries in Western Africa who still have that currency and they still haven't been able to uh, dissociate themselves from France in terms mm. of currency. Mm. So that's the hold. So I'm not saying that France thinks of itself as an empire, but France works as a financial empire for these countries, uh, mm. which is a truth for anyone in the world to know, but nobody wants to say anything because it's a European power, of course. And you can just imagine if this would happen, I don't know, with Russia, for instance. Uh, not that, not that I am a big fan of Putin. I don't think that. So I'm not saying that. I'm just thinking of you know the influence, uh, mm. or or even even for that matter, if it happened with China, you know, and then there will be huge human cry over how China is dominating. There's still this with African countries about China yeah. dominating and coming mm. as a colonizer, whereas China never had colonial relations with Africa, mm. right? Mm. Um, so. So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's basically about um, how much we can allow European powers to dismantle economies elsewhere, right? Um, and that's, that's what it is. I mean, they, they maintain, France maintains these 14 countries, 12, 14 countries 
in a perpetual state of impoverishment uh, because of their policies. Uh, and, and many successive French, French presidents have talked about dissociating themselves with the France Afrique, as it's called, and no one has actually done it. They have made it worse. French intervention in Mali, for instance, yeah. you know, they've, they've made it worse. Mm. Uh, so, and, and these are crimes that we benefit from as French citizens, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, I think there's a direct impact on our lives. Uh, yeah. We get rich because people are getting impoverished there. And we are complicit somewhere in that. France mm. selling uh, Rafale to Egypt or to India, we are directly concerned because that money is coming into the French government, right? We're directly so we we are complicit in that, right? Mm. The only the only way out is of course creating structures that we 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 are no longer complicit and that France divests from that, um, mm. which won't happen because uh, there is not a great movement. Uh, people mm. are not even aware, and then if they are aware, they're like, yes, but we need money. You know, that's the right answer is that we need jobs, we need money, uh, and it's just about us most of the times, mm. yeah. And so I think that's the whole, uh, again, I'm coming to a very Marxist thing about, about, about finance, isn't it? The way the finance structures the world. Uh, and you, we've seen that with Britain and with the United States in terms of finance doesn't see race. It doesn't really make a difference mm. uh, as long as you have the right pound or the right dollar, your skin won't make any difference. We know with Rishi Sunak, for instance. Yeah. We know we know that with his wife, who's supposed to be an Indian citizen, but who's practically more, who's practically richer than the queen, right? Yeah. So we know about that, uh, yeah. and and so 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 I, I'm I'm just saying that it's it's also the color of money, and, and mm. so money and power both plays. So I'm thinking of Foucault and Marx at the same time. It's it's both money and power, uh, and 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 the. And the divestment has to come through this and you know the whole weapons industry or this finance industry will collapse then but that will not happen because uh because the people in power don't want that to happen right i mean look at the policies that you you will know about the international if you're if you're in international relations since you're in international relations you will know about the policies of the uh, imf or the world bank so 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 i i think it's a it's a it's a nexus it's a huge nexus and I don't know if I, as one person, or even if there are 20 people like me, as a collective, we can actually fight that system. There has to be a mass movement. The only way out is the mass movement. Uh, the Gilets Jaunes in France is a mass movement. And they were quite helpful in you know, blocking the country and saying no to certain things. But, but they, there's only so much they can do because then COVID happened mm. and it all just went from there to, uh, but we noticed how, the police or even, you know, the authorities repressed the whole movement of Gilets Jaunes. We noticed that uh, mm. there were injuries, you know, people became disabled, some people lost their eyes. I mean, there's lots of things that happened at that time in France. Mm. Right? Um, I would think that COVID, you know, came as a savior somewhere for the children, for the people as well, because, you know, uh, people were, back home and they didn't have to fight the police all the time, mm. you see. And then there were riots, there were literal riots on yeah. the streets. Mm. Everyone saw that. Uh, mm. but, but I guess people are now aware of this happens in most social movements in France now. Mm. Anything, uh, any social movement, and this will happen. You know? mm. Mm. So, like, I mean, because the things we talk today, these are quite depressing, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I still, you know, like cannot believe that when you go for your, you know, this like citizenship thing. I mean, they ask you to change your name. They don't ask you. They don't put pressure on you. Well, they put pressure on you without putting pressure on you. But there is this thing on the form. It, it is integrated into the form. So, so I'm not saying she's asking me to do it. She is just pointing me to the form. <laughs> this is what it is. Do you want to change your name? And the question is asked, do you want to change your name? And then when you ask them why, they, they ask you to refer to the form where it's very clearly stated that, you know, for reasons of integration, for reasons of assimilation or integration, whatever the word is used, 
uh, it might be easier for you to uh, have a French name. Why not say a Christian name? Why not say a Catholic name? A French name for me is Saeed or, or you know, uh, mm. Mohammed is a French name for me. I, the, mm. the first Mohammed I ever encountered in my life was either in Britain or in France. So, and for me, it's a French name. So, and then I so, know Mohammed is not a French name. It's a Maghrebian, Maghrebian name. Yes, well, there are Mohammeds who are Maghrebian and who are French. And so Maghrebian is not a nationality. It's an ethnicity or mm -hmm. whatever regional appellation, if you like, uh, you know. Um, and so th there is this very strange way of looking at things uh, where whiteness is not named. So white people are not white, they are French. So mm -hmm. it, it's really odd. But, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think this, is, this has got to do with again coming back to colonization of algeria you see and most most french people even most french people in the universities haven't read about the, about algeria they don't know what really happened they don't know because this is not something that people want to know or want to teach and when you think of algeria and this is something about um, they always say les français et les musulmans you know the français the french and the muslims but french is not a religion you can't call them Muslims. So, so it's Algerian French, I would have preferred uh, mm. because Algeria was French. Um, so it's, it's, it's again, this whole idea of white France, you know, mm. is mm. the idea that France is white. Mm. France mm. is majority white already introduces a certain nuance to it. Right? Mm. But the, the claim that France is white is 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 so so basically what what everyone expects is for people to be French citizens without asking to be French citizens or without wanting to be friend without wanting the rights of French citizens so this is what is expected uh, so you become French and you keep quiet about it after that and then you don't ask for any more rights uh, France has signed the Charter of Human Rights. Um, you should be allowed to uh, talk about your religion. You should be, allowed, but no, French constitution thinks. Um, I'm, 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 I will not be surprised to see in the coming years that there will be more restrictions in place. Uh, but, you know, um, it's the majority white community that does not revolt. And that is what is uh, really disappointing. The majority white community will only say within circuits that, oh, this is terrible, and that's the end of it. So they've done their job, this is terrible. If this happens to majority white community, as we know what happened with, you know, when Macron tries to pass the laws on, 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 um, on you know, anything from uh, employment to uh, retirement, of course, we should uh, fight for that. But it's what Skimberly Crenshaw calls asymmetrical solidarities. Mm. The solidarity is never, never given back to people uh, whose lives every day has been curtailed, you see, uh, mm. never. Uh, so, so Angela Davis would be huge in France, but Asa Traore would be considered, you know, someone who's fighting for her, uh, for justice because her brother was killed by the police, Adama Traore. And Asa Traore would be considered, uh, you know, someone who's marginal and she shouldn't be celebrated and she is against France or something. Her brother died at the hands of the police and she wants to know what really happened. So she is French. So she mm. has a right to know. Uh, but mm. but it's, it's always been like that. It's always been like that. It's always about how minorities should keep quiet. And so the people who've benefited the most in France from this kind of environment, and as we say, as we see, in, in Britain and in the United States is, about, is white women and queer people. Queer people and white women start, have started getting their rights much more than what it is for people of color or Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever was promised in France Hollande in 2012, 2012 when France Hollande became president, he became president because he wanted to, he wanted to um, legislate on same-sex marriage and he was for same-sex marriage and he passed the same-sex marriage law. He also wanted foreigners to have the right, like in Britain, to vote in local elections. 
he did not pass that law. He just quietly shelved it. Shelved it. So we know who was included. Uh, and coming from me from a queer person is really interesting because we know who was included and we know who benefits from this kind of you know, diversity, whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. speak. Um, so, so that question has been in French election, in the French elections for the last at least 15 years that I have been seeing on French elections, you know, not these last two elections that happened, but before, about letting foreigners who are in the country for the last five years to vote for local elections. Uh, and that has not happened. Only Europeans can vote in local elections, not everyone. So if you have your life for 10, 15 years in France, uh, and you've got documentation to prove that, you still cannot vote for local elections. Forget standing for local elections. So th there, there is this discrimination at every step, at every step. Uh, and, and then, oh yeah, but then they can become French if they want to. Well, some people don't want to become French and want to live in France. What is the problem with that? What is the problem with that? There is, there is no problem with that, right? So is that, is that they're not a traitor to the nation? Not, they're not, they're not planting bombs in France. I mean, what is the problem? It's, mm -hmm. it's just a very nationalist kind of frame that people walk into, you know? And I think that's there with most hypernationalist societies in the West. Mm -hmm. Or for that matter, India. I mean, look at what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I've always held this, that, you know, if France and India are having a wonderful relationship with Modi and Macron is also because they both agree on what should be done to Muslims. Uh, I've always held this, and this is really shocking because Macron will, does not consider himself to be an Islamophobe. Uh, but I think what Modi is doing in India, uh, or what Modi's India is doing to Muslims and other communities uh, is, is like a wet dream for France. France wants to do it as well, you see. It's, it's just that, it's, it's just that uh, they are so scared of what will the people think? You know, there's also this because Macron completely revolts when it gets out into the international world that he is not Islamophobic, he's not banning this or that. And he's, he's totally, you know, he becomes paranoid of it coming out of France. And I, I think the problem with the French people in terms of racism and other discrimination is exactly this. They want to be able to discriminate, but they don't want the world to know. <laughs> because they don't want to be judged by the world because they have different standards. And so that's the problem. It's the exceptional standards that they have towards themselves, which makes it complicated, you see. Mm. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's really funny. It's really funny because, and then they will have commentary and commentary on the racism in the United States, totally uh, erasing the fact that, you know, wow, this is something happening at home as well. Uh, and this is also true of people, um, in my department where I work, English and um, not department as such, but you know, in, in, in the English and American studies, this is especially true of people working in American studies who will never look at racism in France and only look at racism in the United States, um, which is really very, very mind boggling because how can you look at something without looking at the larger picture? Mm. This happens a lot in American studies in France. Mm. Yeah. And so, so I'm, I'm not considered to be in American studies, I'm more considered in British studies in France. So obviously uh, my uh, word doesn't have much value, but I can notice, you know, when we have different people coming from different universities and we can notice that they will not say a word about France. And the only thing they will say is about the United States because they only specialize in the United States. So you can specialize in only United States without looking at the other picture. Um, mm. which of course for me is extremely problematic and not very serious research yeah mm. Mm. i mean it's quite interesting because i mean um, i think chomsky said something like that because he he was saying that there is hope for america in terms of race relations but there's no hope in like you know paris or in or like in like uk you know because these are like so entrenched the society hardware it will be this this will be the last countries to get rid of any kind of you know this kind of situation and that kind of makes sense what like you know i mean my experience your experience what we are seeing you no know, last by my last 25 years of my life here i mean i mean it's it's there always there it's always there and there is hope though there is hope though because um 
people of color have always resisted. And we work with archives of feminists of color, of people of color in France, of you know, people, women who came from Africa and made name in France, uh, uh, West African women from West Africa in France, and they revolted against colonization. So there is hope because these communities now are becoming bigger in the sense that they are not involving just people of color, but also uh, people who are not of color, uh, but realize their own complicity. And, uh, you know, it's kind of becoming, it's a collective, right? And as I always say, it's not because you're my skin folk that I will always agree with you because I will not agree with Preeti Patel or Rishi Snark. And there are many Preeti Patels and Rishi Snarks in our communities, right? Mm. And there is a lot of anti-Black racism in our communities as well. I mean, yeah. let's face it. Yeah. And so, 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 so I, 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 I think it's it's about the politics. I'm more interested in people's politics. Um, you know, it's it's Pivak who used to say this, right? And I've heard her say this. It's not it's not the fact that you're white that counts. It's what you do with it that counts. Right? Mm. I mean, you you're born into something, and you you, you what you do with it will obviously count. And so so it's it's just that it's about people coming together and resisting these policies, these absurdities, uh, this kind of very, uh, you know, stark discrimination from stark to very subtle discrimination uh, and people resisting that in their own ways. And that is what is interesting. And I, I, I think it's not just people of color doing it, but a lot of other people doing it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then there are people of color who are collaborating actively with state power probably because by analogy they will get more power why not i mean that's that's they are looking looking to their for their for their own benefit but that's also the people that we are work, working against right uh, mm. so i think the hope is there uh, mm. and the hope is, is is the way how we get more and more people uh, to continue working towards uh, you know social justice i mean it's not it's emancipation for everyone it's basically yeah. about that yeah Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I really want to do is like, I will come back to you in future about your more, you know, more technical yeah. issues that things you are researching. And you no, know, one of the things I always struggle, you know, like the academics use lots of technical words and all those terminology, oh, and, which are not accessible to the general public. I want someone to say those things in a, you know, simple way so that people can actually understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I've, I've tried to make my speech much more clearer because, uh, you know, using words that nobody understands uh, makes it complex for myself and for the others because the questions are always raised in that. Yeah. The questions are always raised in that. Um, so I try to keep away from jargon, but there are certain things like heteronormativity or heteropatriarchy that I cannot do away with. And so when there is a demand for clarification, then I do that then yeah. I will probably clarify. Uh, what I generally do in terms of decolonization, decolonial and queer, I explain how I use them because mm. otherwise people are completely lost uh, mm -hmm. and, and they latch on to various different modes of thinking, which mm. are not very productive. Yeah. You, you mentioned about your parents and then they're saying that, you know, the post-colonial study versus decoloniality. I mean, so, I mean, can you can you give us more insight you know, of what these two things like? I mean, are they related or are they different? Or, or I mean, <laughs> I think that there's a very good essay by Gurinder Bamra who traces uh, the the roots R O U T T E S the roots of postcolonial and decolonial thinking and you know what they actually do and what they mean. For me, uh, you know, there are two geographical obvious reasons uh, obvious uh, regions. Uh, mm. that are invested in post-colonial thinking, South Asia, Africa, et cetera, and mm. then decolonial thinking from uh, South America and, you know, uh, mm. Yala and, and Africa, of course, in, in South Africa. Uh, and so there is one, one of that, and the other is, of course, one is against uh, post-colonial studies uh, with sites, Pivak and Baba, were ob obviously taking into account the opposition to colonial discourse and how colonial discourse uh, you know, was imposed on the world, uh, whereas decolonial thinking is is really about coloniality and modernity. You know that mm. the, the triad: coloniality, modernity, rationality. So they take in terms of that conceptualization, which is both will strive for social justice, and there are you know uh, there are overlaps, 
um, in terms of social justice uh, movements in both uh, post-colonial and decolonial thinking, but uh, post studies, as I see it, is, is more about representation, and you know that's where it gave rise to the you know the movements like equality uh, and diversity inclusion. But it's more about representation. So it started with English English departments, or you know with Said, uh, with uh, studying particular aspects of English literature. Or French literature for that matter, or literature for that matter, or art for that matter. So it's more about representation and you know, mm -hmm. it's about representation of politics. Whereas, um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive sense, I'm not meaning representation yeah. politics yeah. in the sense of reasons now, but it's more, more about that. Uh, whereas, uh, decolonial studies um, obviously conceptualize modernity, coloniality, uh, then also Eurocentrism and you know, what Eurocentrism is, even though Said uses the word Eurocentric. You know, mm. uh, Mm. And, and 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 so so that, that's that's the kind of difference that I see. Uh, but I guess this again, this is my observation or secondhand reading after Palmer's uh, essay, because Palmer's essay really explains in detail uh, mm. the overlaps and the dissonances, uh, the mm. divergences, what happens in both these uh, constituencies, post colonial and decolonial studies. Now. The issue today is, of course, uh, that many of us have specialized or, you know, have studied both. And so uh, many of us can see the connections. So if decolonial studies was, you would use Kuzikanki, but Kuzikanki is making reference to Spivak, mm. you see. Spivak, of course, Subaltern studies and, and Subaltern forms of knowledge is, is very much part of post-colonial canon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, post form of thinking. So, so there are these uh, roots that keep on coming and going between the two, and then both will claim Fano and Césaire. Both postcolonial studies and decolonial studies will claim Fano and Césaire. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so there are these claims that are made to certain thinkers. Um, I don't know what the way out is, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, because now we're at, we're at this point where uh, the daggers are drawn and no side is willing to say that you know the war is over um, <laughs> but i don't necessarily see that as a war because i see that more as conversation between the two mm -hmm. kinds of study uh, mm -hmm. with, with the overlaps and with the imperfections of both the studies as well mm -hmm. because this is what is pointed out most of the times is the imperfection of the other field Mm -hmm. right? um, as though the field that we are speaking from or the, the point where we are speaking from is the perfect one. Mm -hmm. um, you see, there, there are these, there are these uh, things. And then, then the word decolonization is again claimed by both, right? mm -hmm. even though it is claimed uh, much more uh, by postcolonial studies because of the visible uh, non- because of probably the visible non-attachment of the word post-colonial to decolonization, because you know there's the word "de" in decolonization, mm, mm, mm. Uh, so they are much more vocal about it. Uh, mm. But but there there are again you know uh, various ways they've understood decolonization as well. Mm, mm. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, it's again been adapted to the the, the, the intellectual thinking that's hap that's happened in both the fields. Right now. What is interesting with decolonial is that it has a very different trajectory everywhere else uh, because it's become, a, as many all would say, it's a practice, it's, it's a politics. So it has become extremely, uh, it, it's extreme, it's, it's, it's rather attractive to activists and militant organizations, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So people who are mobilizing or organizing, they would rather use the word decolonial. And I speak from France. And so particularly in France, it is huge uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, making, um, in terms of social movements, for instance, most social movements concerned with people of color will claim the word decolonial. Um, and, and, and then there's also the counter movement, which is the, you know, the, um, the standard French, uh, mobilization against the word decolonial. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that constant opposition uh, mm. of uh, to decolonial, uh, which is now looked upon as almost extremely dangerous, uh, probably like 
probably like terrorism mm. uh, b- because it wants to see a, a very different world. So I think the, the terms have evolved. Uh, mm. And if postcolonial did not reverberate in France, it's because uh, postcolonial studies was always restricted in France because, because of French theory, of course, mm-hmm. which was much more important, apparently, um, and postcolonial studies, even though there are, you know, connections between French theory and postcolonial studies through the Derrida. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But yeah, so th- this is how I, I make sense of it. Now, the word decolonial in South Asia uh, <laughs> is making it inroads, but South Asia is where post-colonial studies uh, has its most stronghold. So it's yeah. making it difficult, you see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Probably through small turn, I don't know. I don't know, but it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of difficult in South Asia though, because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's par excellence the you know the uber post-colonial uh, yeah. constituency that we have mm-hmm. so, yeah mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm kind of aware of time so i thank you so much yeah. for you know spending so much time with me a couple of things i really want to touch we are academics and we also you know care about our students um i mean what what kind of advice do you want to give the students who are coming to the university or who are already in the university what kind of outlook um, they sh- should have, you know, because it's, it's, it's a place where they can learn, they can unlearn, they can, you know, explore knowledge, they can, they can do lots of things there. This is, this is the choice they will make. I mean, any advice for them? Any, any like, even like, you know, something, you know, we want to tell them, you know, do this or do that. Perhaps th- this will do good to you or perhaps, you know, just, just go for fishing, you know, one day. <laughs> Or like pick up like Foucault's book or like, you know. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to give a blanket advice though, but you know, um, I generally tell my students that um, your professor knows only so much. And yeah. if you don't agree with your professor, if you don't agree with your teacher, then you need to tell them that you don't agree. Now, the other thing that I always tell them is, I don't want to know your opinions because you know, they all come up with these very uh, solidified opinions, which cannot change. And they, I think this, I think that, without any supportive argument. So mm. I don't want their argument, but I want evidence. So I, I think this is really important because most of the I thinks from the student is I feel, you know, so they feel something. Uh, and, and we work in an environment, in an academic environment where emotions should have their place, but doesn't mean that the texts that we write have to be run down by emotion totally. Uh, there also has to be a readability where people can actually understand what you're trying to say, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, the one thing that I always tell them is do not give me your opinion, give me your opinion based on evidence based on a supportive argument, right? So this is, this is something that's interesting. And then the next thing I tell them is also, there is nothing that we can think of that has, hasn't been thought of before. So I always say, this is not a novel idea. Someone has probably said this before. And so if someone presents to me an idea that they think is original, I will do my research to see if it is actually original, right? Mm. Uh, so when students make claims, very tall claims about this is my idea, I would probably point them to someone who's already said that before. And, and I think there's a measure of humility is what I'm looking at from my students. So there, there have been people who've come before us and there will be people who will come after us. But the mm-hmm. people who've come before us have already built certain systems. I'm not the first person of color uh, taking issue with colonization or whatever. I mean, there have been mm-hmm. people before me. And so if I'm unaware of these people, uh, and then especially in France, when students discover Césaire and Fano, and they know that Césaire and Fano were non-white French people, they are very surprised because they know they have existed and they have been appreciated, right? Because, and so so I think it's, it's, it's about building on what has already been, literature review if you'd like, but building on whatever has been said, because then they will find connections with what they are saying to what has already happened in a particular times, this 50s or the 60s when Cesare and Fano were writing. Mm. 
mm. right? Mm. And so, 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 one, I tell them, I am not, uh, I hate the word God, but I, I don't know everything. And so I'm willing to, to learn. And it's, it's, it's a learning journey for both of us. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were my student, then it's a learning journey for me as well. One of my students uh, made me read a lot of work because I hadn't read that. And it was great because I was, it, it was some, an area that I was totally lacking in. Mm -hmm. right? So I tell them, you know, it's just a give and take. It's reciprocal. But at the same time, I only, I may be a teacher, but I, the only thing I have is more experience than you. That's all I have, you know, or maybe I read more than you and that's about it. So you cannot replace reading. You just cannot replace it. So if it's going, going fishing and if that's, that's how you take a break, then of course go fishing. Yeah. But there is also the mandatory readings that you will have to do because that's the only way. Uh, in order to critique European philosophy or Marx, you will need to read Marx. Not yeah. what you will also need to read what others have said of Marx, but you will need to read Marx. Right? Mm. In order to use a particular word, and this is my favorite, uh, that I don't now I know what it means, but I don't usually use the word hermeneutics because I don't know what it means. So, what's the mm. point of using a word that I don't know what to, yeah. that I don't know the meaning of, right? And so, I always tell them this that the only advice that I can give you is about do the reading and be sure of what you're saying because the person who will read it will be very sure of when they are criticizing what you have to say mm. right i have not been through covid as a student right so i cannot relate to i can empathize but i cannot understand the situation of our students who've been through these two years of covid and ongoing uh, i can't really say uh, that I will have experience being a student and being through COVID. I, I don't have that experience. I have not worked on COVID, so I can't really tell them what to do for their mental health. And I think this has been disastrous for a lot of our students uh, in terms of mental health. So the only thing I can say is I'm not a trained practitioner for mental health. Please see someone who is. That's all I can say. Mm. I understand that it's, it's a complex situation for everyone, uh, but I, a lot of my students uh, had terrible times finishing their work on time. Mm. Uh, I guess it's the same for you. Uh, for all mm. the teachers that we saw our students slide into a sort of soft depression, which became a little, yeah. you know, from minor to major, uh, mm. because social life was totally restricted. Mm. Uh, so, so, so I also, so this is what I tell them that I can't, I, I'm not the key to everything. I can't tell you everything. I mean, if I haven't been through COVID, I can't tell you because I have neither worked on COVID nor have I lived it, lived through it personally as a student. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can't, so the, the, it's also showing the students and telling the students that we have limits, that teachers are also, you know, there are only certain areas that we specialize in. We don't specialize in everything. So if you mm -hmm. ask me anything about 1645 in France, I'd probably have no clue of what happened in 1645 in France. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Um, I mean, like I mean, one of the things, I mean, I really want to add on this. Um, I mean, I was in Toulouse a couple of years ago because my university kind of, you know, this collaborative thing with... with Memorandum, yeah. Yeah, so, and then I was invited to come to one of the classes and it was fascinating, you know, the, the colleagues are brilliant. The students are very, very involved. Um, but I saw this, the class is very big. <laughs> it's very mobbed as well, uh, which is very good. Um, and then I, I was asked to say something and I, I don't know like what to say. And then I just like said that... Um, I mean, my story is I am here today in Toulouse or, you know, I came to the West and then, you know, made my life and became an academic. The, the only thing actually helped me to sustain that thing is compassion and kindness by other people. And that's, that's so important. So like, you know, in, in our teaching environment or any other environment, you know, show kindness, show, show compassion for everyone, you know. Because you know, we don't know how other person is living their life. You know? um, so I think kindness is, is so important for me. You know, I, I see like, you know, if I look at my last 25 years around the world, I can, I can see, you know, not many faces, just six, seven faces 
who actually made my life? Who actually gave me that, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can make it. You can make it. You, 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 you are good, you know? So we need those people around us, just like kind to everyone. And then when society is becoming yeah. unkind, always try to resist because that's not good for anyone. This will, this will harm everyone. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> so that's my two pens there. Um, thank you so much. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's an absolute pleasure. You know, you made some time. You know, we, we talked some amazing stuff. Thank you so much. Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting okay. me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. You take care. Bye. Seigneur, Seigneur, car avec les soldats, il est très 